Were Neanderthals brutish ape men or fully human? Welcome to Answers News for Monday, October 30th, 2023. In today's top story, researchers admit that Neanderthals and modern humans are more closely related than most people think. I'm Dr. Georgia Frodo. This is Roger Patterson and Rocket Rob Webb. And so we're going to get right into this with Neanderthals might not be the separate species we always thought. Now, here's the thing. As we. biblical creationists, we never thought they <laughs> were separate the we? species. <laughs> Who's the we here? Yeah. We already knew they were the same species. They're fully human. And we know that not just from, I mean, I'm a geneticist, so I've, I mean, they've sequenced the Neanderthal DNA and compared it to human DNA, and we know it's very, very similar. So we would definitely say from a genetic standpoint, they're clearly related. Um, and we're clearly kind of one in the same here, but also from a lot of the archaeological finds for mm -hmm. Neanderthals. Yeah, so as we look at these specimens, uh, these were first found in the uh, area of Germany known as the Neander Valley, and they look at these specimens and they thought early on uh, from the 1860s that these were kind of these hunched over, brutish cavemen, and they told the story that they were these grunting, brutish creatures, and they were maybe kind of human-like, and they probably walked upright, but they surely weren't fully human. And you've probably seen all the cartoons and the stereotypical things. And maybe you've even been called a Neanderthal <laughs> by somebody. <laughs> and it's brother, probably sister, condescending. You know. <laughs> but as we've studied them and understand more about them, they had musical instruments. They mm -hmm. painted. They had jewelry. They buried their dead. They, they did all these things that are fully human. And so as more was uncovered about them archaeologically, there was no way that we could refute that they had these fully human capacities from the archaeological perspective, but that's the science side. Biblically speaking, we couldn't say that they weren't humans either. Yeah, biblically speaking, I mean, these are post-flood Ice Age people descended from Adam, of course, and uh, throughout the article, you know, they throw out a lot of imaginary times, you know, like uh, multiple thousands of years, of course, and what was so interesting, though, is they talk about, like Mr. P was saying here, uh, you know, tools, makeup, jewelry, they buried their dead, and they cooked meals. They said they had a cooking a range of meats, including goat, deer, and horses. Mm. Sounds pretty sounds, human to me. Sounds and good pretty to tasty, me. right? Yeah, I'd throw Roger's that on the grill. Yeah, I'd smoke that. Um, but um, I, I love how the article says it here. They say, gone is the archaic stoop and animalistic grunting. Today, our primitive relatives appear to have intentionally buried their dead, made jewelry, and made even uh, created art. Evidence that they carefully used fire in their technology only further builds a case that the Neanderthal culture was far from simple and far more keen to our own. So you see, they weren't just dumb brutes. Right? They were actually very intelligent people. They actually made all these great things. So it was, it's actually a paradox for evolution. They can't explain it, but it is consistent with the biblical worldview. And there are a lot of different human forms in the sense of, um, you know, we talk about Neanderthals, but there's also Denosovans, which is another sort of more what they would call archaic human. There are, there's Homo erectus, which is, again, should be Homo sapiens, because they've given them different species names, because supposedly they're either, um, they either diverged off of the, some, this ape-like ancestor from all of us, and they kind of went their own way, but this line became modern human, or they're somewhere in that line leading to modern human, but as we study them and understand them as much as we can from fossils, from archaeology, from DNA, we see that they're fully human and they're just, you know, there's a, God put a lot of variety even within the human form and it's many audiences I know that I've looked out on over the years, trust me, I can see some <laughs> of those heavy brow ridges yes. and some of those other things that are associated with Neanderthals, we still see some of those traits even in people today, um, but we're all human beings, right, made in the image image of God descended from Adam and Eve. Yeah, and as we think about all of those characteristics, it's genetic diversity that God's programmed in as they spread out after the flood. We see those things in different people groups, and it's a reminder to us that God has that diversity everywhere. And there's a term that pops up in here that we need to be careful of as we think about uh, consuming uh, different media reports and watching videos, the term here is cousins. But here we're safe to call these our cousins because they belong to the same 
kind because they're humans. They truly are humans. Uh, we'll come to a, a story a little later that we need to be uh, looking out for that word because this other group right. is not our cousins. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we hear um, evolutionary connections here and there, and we've got to watch out for words like that and make sure we don't get confused as we hear those things. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Dinosaur feathers may have been more bird-like than previously thought. Okay. Over and over and over again, we see this idea that dinosaurs evolved into birds and birds are modern day dinosaurs. Uh, and it's even confusing to read articles like mm -hmm. this sometimes yep. because you, you're like, wait a minute, are they talking about a dinosaur or are they talking about a bird? It's because a non-avian like, dinosaur. Yeah, uh, a non-avian dinosaur, dinosaur is a bird, which is really confusing, but true. So um, anyway, so what they're looking at is the keratin, which is the main protein in feathers, to see the form of keratin. So there's two basic forms, alpha and beta. And they would say that birds typically have beta keratin in, that make up their feathers, but they used to think that dinosaurs had more of the alpha keratin. And so the, what they say is that those would have been more flimsy feathers and wouldn't have actually allowed them to fly. And so um, they seemed very different. But now they've done some testing and they say, well, it could just be because of heat and that heat has caused the beta keratin to go to alpha keratin. It just folded differently in three-dimensional space. And so they may actually have the same kind of keratin as the bird feather. So yeah. is that legit? Not really. So the line of thinking was that as these creatures were evolving along these lines that uh, the dinosaurs developed these feathers so that they could use them for um, warmth or attracting mates or maybe some flapping and catching insects. They were a, a kind of a, a thing that would help them grab more insects as they were running along the ground, kind of a scooping, like a net-like mechanism, all kinds of things like this that feathers could have been useful for. And along this parallel branch, birds were also developing these things. So these two different forms of this keratin, this protein. So proteins are long chains of amino acids that are folded up and they fold in slightly different forms, this alpha and this beta form. So one would be flimsy and one would be strong. Well, there's even a very clear statement from one of the scientists in here. We don't even know if that was true. So the different ways that uh, all of these feathers are fossilized, that as we find them in the, in the fossil record, the different types of pressure and heat that they experience as they're buried, they would undergo these different um, denaturing of the proteins. Think about cooking an egg, the protein changes form, so it changes color. That's the type of changes that we'd see here as these happen. So we go from this alpha form to this beta form as it unfolds, and is that really what's happening here as we see dinosaur feathers and bird feathers, are they changing forms? And that's the question they're trying to answer. And as far as we can tell from what happened here in this article, they didn't really come to any conclusive um, findings here. And it's just a bunch of back and forth and one scientist is disagreeing with another, which is fine. That's the way scientists works. Science works, we, we go back and forth and we disagree with each other and we argue back and forth but there's really no solid conclusions here as they, as they get to the end of the article. Yeah, the research just doesn't fly at the end of the day. It doesn't fly. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, it fell flat. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, it, it, it just cracks me up here too. They say the simplest interpretation is that the distorting effects of fossilization led previous researchers astray in thinking dinosaur and bird feathers were so different molecularly. No, that is not the simplest. That is not, no, it's the biblical explanation that we need to go back to. Biblically speaking, I mean, simply this, birds were made on day five, dinosaurs, land animals were made on day six. That's it. We're done, right? Is that just another reminder that the interpretation matters? No one ever comes to the evidence. No one ever comes to the facts in an unbiased, uh, neutral fashion. Everyone always has a worldview. That's why it's so critical as Christians, we get back to having a right worldview. We got to build all of our thinking on God's word. And thus, whenever we see articles like this, if it doesn't line up with scripture, we need to reject it. And this is also just a warning to Christians too, because we're seeing more and more Christians now buying into this idea that maybe dinosaurs did have feathers. But again, like we say often here, I mean, just a crack in the door, it's going to lead to more and more errors. So it's very important, especially as Christians, we get back to having the biblical worldview in all matters.
And what was interesting too, I, I was looking at this and they said, well, the, two of the feathers that they researched, okay, and actually used for the study. So they compared a 50 million year old bird feather. Now they don't identify what that bird was, but they just say it's a bird feather to a 125 million year old feather from this non-avian dinosaur. What I, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce it. <laughs> Go for it. Do it for some Okay, anyway, so I asked Ga Dr. Gabriella Haynes, who's our paleontologist that has actually done a lot of research on this particular subject of feathered dinosaurs, and she said, well, that non-avian dinosaur, that's a bird. It's a bird. <laughs> so they essentially compared a yeah. bird feather to a bird feather, and they both had different forms of the keratin. Mm -hmm. So it just shows that depending probably on the way in which it was fossilized, the amount of heat that was there at that time, you could have beta keratin, you could have alpha keratin. But you know, regardless of what this article says, how it goes back and forth and doesn't really come to any conclusion, I mean, look at the title of the article. Dinosaur feathers may have been more bird-like than previously thought. The article doesn't actually show that or say mm -hmm. that yeah. at all. But again, it's you got to read closely what they're actually yep. finding. But that's even what the name of that dinosaur or that bird means that they think is a dinosaur. Chinese bird dinosaur. Yes. <laughs> Sino ornithosaurus. Okay, it's that's exactly what it is mm -hmm. because it's actually a bird. It's covered with feathers. And then they go on to describe all these behaviors. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah, this is great. They help them this attract mates. They launch themselves into the air and, and could glide with their wings as they ran. Yeah, apparently dinosaurs can launch themselves and in the air and glide from now, place to place. Now those are <laughs> inferred behaviors and we might not disagree with those things, but we can't know those things from the right. fossils. Behaviors are, interpretations or inferences from the types of structures that we find, but we can't know them for certain from those types of fossils and it's a, that we you know, find. This is a type of historical science, right? We, we can observe evidence today. I mean, we can see certain things today, but what we think about how those things came to be basically from what happened to them in the past, what was going on then, that is very much based on our worldview and our starting point. Do we start with God's word that tells us that dinosaurs and, and birds are separate kinds, right? They're not related to one another, or do we not? Because that's going to affect then how we interpret and understand these things. So. Yep. Yep. All right, BC nurse, meaning British Columbia, uh, risk losing license in witch trial over opposition to radical gender ideology. So um, Amy Hamm is the name of this nurse, and basically what she did was she put up a billboard um, in British Columbia that, was, that said, I heart J.K. Rowling. So J.K. Rowling is the author of the Harry Potter series, and um, she, heaven forbid, <laughs> happened to think that men are men and women are women, and um, he's championed what's called safe spaces, right, for women and children. And um, so she's so she was basically, this nurse was saying, I'm in agreement with her on that. And for that, she was charged as being disseminating medically inaccurate information. That's what she got charged with. Wait a minute. A nurse <laughs> believed that boys are boys and girls are girls. Yep. Basic and biological. agreed with Rowling, who has received a lot of heat in the UK and over and in social media and in and the broad media in general for standing up for women's rights basically mm -hmm. and saying specifically with the transgender issue. Now, as far as we can tell, Rowling claims some Christian heritage and roots and this lady seems to just be a secular feminist promoting mm -hmm. women's rights, but they're trying to say women are being having their rights taken away by transgender people who are trying to move into those spaces, men who are trying to move into the space of women using bathroom facilities and other, other types of spaces that women see as a violation of their privacy and of their rights and their access to those spaces, especially young girls who are, who are endangered by those things at a, a much larger degree. And she's going to lose her license to practice medicine for that. That's yeah. a very dangerous way to, <laughs> for, to be For a headed. nurse affirming basic biological science here. And, uh, essentially, here's the allegation. They say the nurse made uh, discriminatory and derogatory statements regarding transgender people between approximately July 2018, March 2021, as a nurse or nurse educator. Translation here, this is basically the modern-day blasphemy law of the religion of sexual humanism. Anytime you speak against this religion, this is going to be the consequence. And that's the sad thing that we're living in in our nation, in our culture 
today in the West in general. Um, it just reminds me as a Christian, don't be afraid to boldly speak truth into a world that falls for lies every single day. We got to keep standing up for our free speech, really God-given rights. Otherwise, they will be taken away. So let's continue to be bold. Let's continue to stand on God's word no matter the cost. Now, does that mean we should be using hateful words and, and being derogatory and mean toward people who are in a sinful lifestyle? No, we're, we're not mean and we don't promote violence. We don't do those things. We come to them with grace and truth, promoting the hope that they can find in Christ to find their true identity, not in their sexuality, not in their, their um, physical bodies, not in any expression of their emotional identity, but who they are, who God has created them, and ultimately who they can be restored to in true union with Christ in the gospel it message. It cracks me up with the double standards here because they, they accuse her of hate speech, but then it says, uh, she followed the complaint against her. She received tens of thousands of messages that threatened her with hate and abuse. Right, so you see that double standard there. You see so much for tolerance, right? Yeah, that, that's what's always the irony of all of that, right? I mean, she has not actually said anything hateful or mm -hmm. discriminatory or derogatory or treated her patients. She's had no complaints, nothing. And yet, you know, she, she's the one being accused of this, whereas all these other people, it's fine if they want to send her hate mail or do that. So, um, yeah, it's really a going against her ability to have free speech, which is part of the Canadian uh, laws and rules there that you're supposed to be able to have that. But more and more, it's being restricted in Canada um, to only certain kinds of speech. So it's really not free speech anymore. But and as, as Rob said, Canada. yeah, as Rob yeah. said, we do need to it's, continue to stand up for that. And we'll talk about that a little more later, so. but regardless of whether something is legal or illegal, um, we still have to stand boldly on the truth of God's word and share the gospel, right? Regardless mm -hmm. of what the consequences may be, we're called to obey God's law uh, above man's law. Amen. All right, Montana judge keeps in place a ban on enforcement of law restricting drag shows, drag reading events. So this is one of those articles that you read it and you just, it, it's hard to imagine what is going through the mind of someone, especially a judge, so this is a federal court judge, in thinking this way. So basically there was a law in uh, Montana that they wanted to get passed that would ban drag shows, you know, from libraries, which just makes sense, um, not allowing children to yeah. see these things. And the law basically would fine people, they might lose licenses, they would have to, um, they could be sued by people, by children then when they got older, if that caused them harm or damage. And so it seemed like a really good law, but this judge, and I quote said, there is no evidence before the court no evidence before the court indicates that minors face any harm from drag-related events or other speech and expression critical of gender norms. So it basically saying that they, they, they have not presented any evidence to show that this is going to be harmful to these children. And you're just like, how, how is that possible? How could anyone possibly think that? It's amazing. And this is happening in... Um, Montana. Montana. So I grew up out west, yeah. <laughs> went yep. to school in Montana. Uh, this is a, a very interesting development there because the legislature has passed this law, it's enacted, and then it goes to the district court there where it's, it's blocked from being um, enacted because the Helena Pride event was having its 30th anniversary and they were want, didn't want to um, prevent them from being able to hold their festivities there this last summer. And so the law was um, put on hold and they weren't allowed to enforce the law. And so the judge put this in place because they were afraid that this law would censor people from their free expression of all of these different activities that were laid out here in the law and they might self-censor and not express all of these things in public because if there happened to be minors present while they were doing these lewd acts, then they would be prosecuted under this law. Well, that sounds like shame and a right form of shame because you're doing a lewd act where there might be minors present. Maybe that's your conscience crying out to you God doesn't want me doing these things. And God has put that sense into us that we, we know these things are wrong. But as Romans 1 describes, people have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and they move further and further down that path and God gives them over and abandons them to those lusts. But 
God has given us the opportunity to have these laws in place to use the government to hold back some of that evil and here this judge is overriding those things but the individual's consciences are still uh, stopping them from from going ahead with doing these things yeah the apostle paul says we all have a conscience right god has written his law on our hearts that's how we know right from wrong we don't have to have society or anyone teaches we inherently already know these things to be wrong because god has given us that conscience which it just amazes me like uh mr p was saying here that um you know basically with with all of this in front of this judge here, it, he's, he's blind to all of it. He's blind to the child abuse happening to these minors through all these drag queen story hours here. And then he talks about, well, we don't want to uh, invite any anti-LGBTQ hostility, but think about the anti-Christian, anti-Christian hostility, right? Do you ever think about the double standard there? Of course not. So, and then the judge also says here um, that the law was written would disport, uh, disproportionately harm not only drag performers, but any person who falls outside of traditional gender and identity norms. So he's only concerned about harm really to these drag queens and really these sexual perverts rather than the actual innocent children in front of us today. Um, and this is just unthinkable one generation ago. I mean, one, one generation ago, this was obvious. This was plain as day. And I think this is just another sad consequence of a culture that has drifted away from the truth of God's word. You think about it, you, you abandon God's word, we're seeing the collapse of Christian morality all across the West. Judges 21, 25 says, in these days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And we're seeing the exact same thing today in our culture. We're seeing a culture that's bent on becoming their own authority. So then anything goes, no ultimate standard. Man decides what is truth, right? So there's no standard for ethics in this culture. And, but how do we fix it, right? That's always the number one thing. We take this information, what do we do? Well, it starts with, the, it starts with us as parents, you know, raising up the next generation to build all of our thinking on God's word. It also starts with pastors too, with Christian leaders standing for biblical truth stop compromising God's word to try to fit with what the culture says. We got to stop uh, bowing down to what they what they say. We need to stand authoritatively and boldly on God's word in every single area. We got to be salt and light in this culture today to really take it back. It was interesting. One of the things they said is wrong with Montana's law. So this, this article is written by people who are not Christians. Um, mm -hmm. They said that, that the law is based on, regulates speech based on its content and viewpoint without taking into account its potential literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, which there is none in a drag performance, okay? But yet they're trying to use that as a way to basically, you know, say that, well, it has one of these things, so it still should be allowed. But a again, and they've also blocked the ability to, um, that so children can still have these surgeries and can still have this affirming, quote unquote, medical care. And, um, in, a, in a separate yet, law. Yeah, yeah, and so they're blocking that too. And you just think this is a cl this is clearly a war on children, war not just children. women we talk about a lot, but a war on children that are being allowed to be mutilated in the mm -hmm. name of this ideology. And uh, we have to stand up for these children in the face of this because they're being they're just being so irreparably harmed by this. Um, and it just it just saddens me. So who you vote for, like if you have a chance yeah. to vote for judges right. and vote for things, know what they stand for. Know where they stand because we 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 can do something about this you know i mm -hmm. mean with our votes and voting people into office who will stand for what is right as much as possible and continue to pray for these judges that they repent that they turn back to god's center because they will stand before a holy god in judgment for what yep. they've done they will all right preacher facing prison for holding bible verse sign near abortion clinic so this is in the uk um in an area near london and so this is a christian pastor who had this sign up there, and it's from Psalm, yeah, Psalm, right, Psalm 139. So this is clearly a verse that we use over in our fearfully, wonderfully made exhibit. So it's not something that's specifically calling people murderers or saying murder is wrong or abortion is wrong, nothing like that, a uh, verse like that, just saying we're fearfully, wonderfully made in the right. image of God, right? And yet he's facing up to six months in prison and more than $1,200 in fine just for holding a Bible verse in what's considered a buff zone um, outside an abortion clinic. Yeah, he claims, uh, I was deeply shocked to receive the summons, and I see this as a prosecution, as an attack on the Bible and free speech. I'm determined to defend myself and fight for justice. Uh, he looks at this, um, this zone that they placed around many of these abortion clinics as basically a, uh, an endorsement for abortion. And the way that the law is written it's written in a way that 
tries to be neutral and it doesn't allow for any type of protest or approval or disapproval of anyone coming into or going out of or what's happening there in the, cl in the clinic. So they're trying to be neutral, but the only thing that happens inside of that clinic is the death of the child who's inside of the mother's womb. And that's a, an act of murder that's happening there. So the only thing that's happening is murder. And so anything that's happening there is the sanction of that murder. And so all this gentleman is doing is proclaiming this Bible verse that acknowledges the sanctity of human life. And he's facing a potential um, $1,200 fine and up to six months in prison for that. And he's willing to face that and challenge this law, back to what Dr. Purdom was saying earlier, he's willing to stand up in the face of this unjust law and stand on God's side and deal with those things and challenge this, and we hope to see him prevail in these things. Yeah, sadly, we're seeing this more and more and just continues to be. Um, and I... I, I I like what he said here. He said, there's a huge principle at stake here. If we are not free to hold a sign with a verse from Psalm 139 on it in a London street, then none of us is free. And then I, I really like the way that this article also ends. It says, instead of lamenting this loss of life, we are industrializing it, making it ever easier to obtain a portion effectively on demand. And now we are criminalizing dissent. Here's the bottom line here. If you disapprove of child murder, if you stand for innocent life that's made in the image of God, you're going to be thrown in prison. That's essentially what it means. It just reminds me of, of Isaiah 520. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. In other words, woe to those who call the murder of innocent children reproductive rights. Woe to those who call the slaughter of kids somehow health care, right? That's needed for women. As Christians, we got to keep standing for, for life, no matter the cost. Let's be salt and light in this culture. Our marching orders are from, from Proverbs 24, 10 through 11. It says, if you faint in the day of adver adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter, because precious lives are on the line, guys. And like Dr. P, Mr. P was saying here, it's neutrality is a myth, right? There is no neutrality. we we got to be standing up. And speaking of that, there's a, uh, a very, very critical vote coming up next week for Ohio residents. It's called Issue 1. If you guys are not familiar with it, this is the most radical pro-death law that we've ever seen in our nation. It is the most wicked, demonic thing I've ever seen, where they're trying to now take abortion rights and put it into the Constitution, making it a constitutional right to be able to kill your child in the state of Ohio. So again, um, if you guys live in Ohio, if you guys know anyone, family members, whatever, in Ohio, make sure you go out there and vote no on this issue because again, precious lives are on the line, guys. Make sure you make sure that your voice is heard. Yeah, and it amazes me because I live in the area, obviously, how many commercials have been on TV trying yeah. to get yep. people to vote for this, including a including one commercial, it just makes me sick every time I see it, of a pastor in a church mm -hmm. telling people to vote yes for this issue. And I, I uh, it just, it, it's so saddening, right? I mean, so sad mm -hmm. to see even, even ch churches participating in this and, and, willing to stay, and willing to stay things like that. So yeah. we really need to inform people and really help them understand this issue. Bring them here to the Creation Museum. Help them see the Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit and all the great resources we have on that because we need to raise a, a generation of children, again, that understand these are living human beings in their mother's womb and they have a right to life. Great. And so we want to do that. Yeah, speak up for those that can't speak for themselves. Have a voice for the voiceless. Yeah. All right, the moon is 40 million years older than we thought. Tiny crystals from Apollo mission confirm. Okay, this is our weekly installment of how evolution has changed yet again. All right, they're constantly writing and rewriting the story because that's what it is. It's a story based on man's ideas about the past rather than based on God's word. So they're actually analyzing um, zircon crystals that were taken from the Apollo 17 mission. So they've been there uh, since 1972. So that's an amazing year because I was born in that year. I was going to say so that's uh, <laughs> uh, so all the way back then, they're now analyzing these things and finding out new things, so to speak, that the moon is actually 40 million years older. And it's all based, though, on their story of how the moon came yeah, about. The nebular disk model, the spinning solar system, all that collection. But there are a lot of disputes about how the moon formed. And this one seems very definitive that it's a, a collision model. That's one of the models out there. There are several other models. This one comes down really firm on the collision model. And there's all this language of this confirms this and this solidifies that. And 
all they're really doing is using a chain of assumptions. Mm -hmm. If this is true, then this is true. And if this is true, then that's true. And they work through this chain of assumptions to say the moon's 40 million years, years older than we thought. Yeah, this that's whole study is based line. on like Mr. Fu was saying, there's like this collision model. There was a colossal collision uh, billions of years ago between Earth and the Mars sized planet called Theia or however you say it, essentially took that and then based on some of the material that blasted off then formed the moon and then over millions and billions of years, it was covered by this magma ocean and then solidified over time that created these zircon crystals. So they think if they date these zircon crystals, they can figure out how old the moon is. But again, that all relies on the assumption. If the assumption is wrong, the conclusion is going to be wrong. That's what we see all the time with these evolutionary uh, articles. They never question whether the model is actually true or not. And just, just a reminder here, I mean, when, when we're looking at the moon, um, you know, they're talking about these direct age determinations and approaches. There is no direct measurement. It's not you, a there's direct not like a yardstick or was, some tag yeah. that shows you, yep, the earth, the, the moon is, is this age. Again, it comes down to interpretation. And really, this whole research is based on the unobservable past assumption upon assumption upon assumption, really naturalistic storytelling. Why? Well, it's because they need to have everything in the solar system formed by naturalistic processes, right? They refuse to give God the glory here. So, and, and guess what, guys? The Bible is the true history book of the universe. Anytime we have a question on history, we need to have a reliable historical document. When we start with God's word, we know the perfectly designed moon, uh, it, it should not lead us to these naturalistic stories, but rather to glorify the God who made it on day four of creation week. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, we're going to finish up here with just telling you about a few conferences we have coming up uh, next year. So Answers for Pastors and Leaders 2024, Authority Answering Compromise. So this is a great conference. I enjoy going to it every year um, and seeing all the different speakers just talking about how encouraging pastors and Christian leaders to stand strong on the authority of God's word, which as you can see, we need that more and more mm -hmm. um, to raise up those next mm -hmm. generation and to really inform their congregations and help them know to be able to do that well. So you can go to Answers answersforpastors.org for more information on that. Also, next year, uh, the Women's Conference, Reclaim, Overcoming the War on Women for the Glory of God. So we actually already sold out one conference uh, for this, so we decided to add another conference. Why not? Um, our weekday conference, <laughs> yeah. which is April 1st through the 3rd, so we still do have slots open for that. And just to give you an extra special plug, so as it turns out, the Speaker of the House was already slated to speak at this conference before he became Speaker of the House. So Mike Johnson, Mike Johnson let's, yeah. we'll see. He might be kind of busy, so we'll yeah, see. Yeah, I was going to say. He might be busy, <laughs> but he's spoken at one of our previous women's conferences, and so um, he's really a great, great guy, and um, yeah. I hope he's able to make it. But we have a great lineup of speakers coming to that conference, so you can go to answersforwomen.org to find out more information mm -hmm. about that. And yeah. then we do have a couple of resources to tell you Yeah, about. so some things that we touched on today, uh, our first article there dealing with humans, and Neanderthals and all those issues. Uh, really great resource, Searching for Adam. This is a biblical case, uh, especially for those within the church who are questioning those things from a biblical perspective. There are many old earth creationists and others who even deny that from within Christianity. Great resource for that. And we love our kids and we want to train them up in the truth. Um, I can't wait to be reading this with my granddaughter pretty soon. <laughs> okay, she'll be uh, into dinosaurs and those things for sure. And a uh, great resource on dinosaurs, speaking of the feathers issue. And I all have three little pieces. ones, and I'm all just right. going to say that they love this. is one of their favorites. So, <laughs> And then dealing with that uh, issue with life, uh, Dr. Purdom and Stacia McKeever have given us this amazing resource uh, dealing with that life issue, especially for younger kids, helping them understand how they are made in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made where life comes build from. Build that biblical foundation that kids need today. Yep. yep. So we love to equip you with great resources that are going to help you and your family and your church grow in those things and understand them from how God's word teaches them to us. All right. We're out of time for today. So we'll see you back here next Monday at two o'clock. Bye. God bless. <laughs>